you. Well, welcome everyone. It's great to see lots of people here for our fourth Sermon of the Year event. Every year we're just amazed by the people who come forward through this event and we're just so delighted that you're here this evening. You're going to hear four cracking sermons, I promise you. So I just want to start by saying a huge, huge thank you to our three amazing judges who are here. Unfortunately, Krish can't be with us this evening, but we're so grateful to the three of you for returning to us. Um, the feedback we got last year from the event was that people had really appreciated the amazing comments that you've made. And we're so grateful that you can give us your time again. We think it's so valuable and we're really, really grateful to you and for believing in this partnership, which is LWPT and LST together. So without further ado, I'm going to um, invite Emma to come and join me. So Emma, I understand that you haven't sort of preached that many times before. This is going to be about your ninth or tenth, is that right? Yeah, correct. So I've done lots of youth speaking before, but this is probably like my ninth or tenth time to adult audience. So yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So do you want to tell us a little bit about the context of the sermon as, as you... Sure. So I'm going to be preaching on Romans chapter 5, verses 5 to 8. So this year I've been studying New Testament Greek at King's College London. And part of that has been kind of getting me involved in Romans. So I decided to go back to that as an original kind of text. Sounds fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Great. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, I'm actually going to read the passage for you because it's only... Um, four or five verses. So if you have Bibles, turn with me. We're going to go to Romans chapter 5, verses 5 to 8. Verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone, someone might possibly dare die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to start just by praying again and just ask God's Holy Spirit just to guide us through this passage. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Come, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that tonight as we look at the power of love, that you would just soften our hearts. You would open our ears, our eyes, just to see you at work in our lives. Lord, I just pray that no one here would leave here without having met with you tonight. <coughs> And I pray that you would come now and just speak powerfully through your spirit. In your name we ask this. Amen. What's your biggest fear? Mine? Not being loved. In a world where I've learned to put up barriers so that I can reject others before they reject me, God tells me love must be recovered. Desperate for love, the soul craves healing. God, the great surgeon, looks within and knows that as our wounds lay open upon his table, they're in pain, unable to move. He is the only skilled surgeon able to bring life up out of the grave. The pain we bear from the violation of not being loved has caused our hearts to close down every shutter in the hope that we can silence the screaming inside. Yet the great surgeon will not rest. Face sharp, head strong, hands steady. He knows that we would avoid surgery at all costs, but we lay there hopeless in need of fresh blood to pulse through our veins. The God of love takes his knife and cuts into the deep so that we may find our God-given purpose life 
to the full, a life of love. The pain we feel becomes worse as the great surgeon moves his knife, removing each blockage so that life can flood in. He sees the wounds and he responds with grace. To heal, we must be brave. Confronted by the past, we must eliminate the pain. God, in his great love, cuts away the scar tissue and there in surgery, he rebuilds our souls. Conflicted inside as the surgeon does his work, the heart wants to stop, but his plans must prevail. Nothing can stop the love of God. The surgeon there with his knife, and in his hands laying bare all my pride. We trust in vulnerability. We hope that we will survive. This is a last resort. This is the only way to be free. God, the great surgeon, at his table with me. The power of love is the power that saves lives. The power of love is the power to conquer the grave. The power of love is the power God wants to place inside of both you and me. The power of love is a free gift and is available today. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, so loved the world that he bore our sin and shame so that we might know the power of his love. You see, shame is a terrible curse. Right there at the start of creation, we see it crippling the hearts of mankind. What did Adam and Eve do after eating from the tree in the middle of the garden? They became afraid, afraid of their nakedness and hid. As we read on, shame again appears in our time. And we see it again in the story of Jacob. What did Jacob do after stealing his brother's birthright? He became afraid, so afraid that he ran away and hid. Turn over to the next book in the Bible and shame continues to affect the souls of mankind. This time with Moses. What did Moses do after he killed the Egyptian? He hid the Egyptian in the sand and when confronted, he became afraid of Pharaoh, so afraid that he fled to Midian and hid. Friends, the shame we hold inside from the effects of sin makes us want to hide. How crippling shame becomes to those who have been abused. How devastating shame becomes when it rips through the lives of those who feel they've not met their parents' expectations. How soul-destroying shame is when relationships become increasingly difficult, making intimacy impossible. Shame holds us back from knowing and experiencing the powerful love of God. And it's why the Apostle Paul hammers the message of love onto a wooden post so hard. It is because love is the one thing that will liberate us from the how that is our shame. Now, some of you might be thinking, that's all great, but I really don't have a problem with shame. But ask yourselves this. Are there areas in your life that you hide from others? Areas you would never wish to be vulnerable in because it would make people see you differently. <clears throat> areas in which you're longing for the love of God to be poured out into your heart. For the great surgeon to heal. If so, then know that we have a God who is able to do more than we can possibly ask or imagine through the power of his great love. This year I was asked, if you could grow in one area in your walk with God, what would it be? My response? Hope. Why? Because as Paul writes in verse 5, hope does not put us to shame. If shame stops us from knowing the powerful love of God, hope opens us up to experience love which has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit is a seal telling us that we no longer have to walk in shame, but can experience the powerful love of God that is living inside of us. Why is this possible? Verse 6 tells us that at the right time, when we were still powerless, that is unable to save ourselves from sin and shame, Christ came and died for the ungodly, for sinners, for Adam, for Eve, for Jacob, for Moses, for you, for me. When we were powerless, when we were afraid, when we were hiding, when we were lying on the surgeon's table, Christ came to say. Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. Someone might die taking a bullet for a friend they love, but rarely would anyone die taking a bullet for an enemy. I know I couldn't. Could you? <coughs> Yet here Paul tells us that if Christ died once and for all, if he did that for us when we were at enmity with God, how much more will God fulfill his promise, which is to heal the wounds inside each of us? How much more will he fulfill the promise that is to give us eternal life? Where one day he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. As heirs to his throne, princes and princesses, children dearly loved, accepted and held by him. We are the workmanship of his hands. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. There on the cross, Jesus gave his life so that we might find it. The pain he felt inside as he bore the weight of our sin and shame. Jesus was so distressed that he cried out to God, Abba, Father, why have you forsaken me? The loneliness, the abandonment, the rejection. He felt it. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice, lay there helpless, unable to move. There was no surgeon's table. Jesus had to die. <laughs> Why? So that we might rise again from the prisons of death that knock on our door. The open heart surgery of shame can only be healed through the power of love. Through Christ's death and resurrection. Receiving his love through the Holy Spirit which lives in us. God the great surgeon wants us to know how long, how high, how wide and how deep is the love of God. He wants us to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that we can be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. All we have to do is welcome Christ into our hearts, being vulnerable, open to his love, changing us from the inside out. When we welcome in the love of God, choosing not to hide and not to run away, it is then that we find the peace and the rest that our souls crave. Recently, I've been through a real hard time to the extent that I've been depressed, to the point of considering ending my life. During this time, family and friends who are here today have gathered around me and supported me through this time. They prayed with me through the dark nights. God was healing a wounded soul. The most powerful thing during this painful time has been to know that I am loved. The power of love heals the soul in such a way that nothing else can. 
It brings a joy so unfathomable that one can only rejoice. It brings a hope that something greater is possible. The depression isn't perpetual, but the love is. Friends, pray to know the love of God. Pray for God to break down the walls which have kept his love from embracing you. Pray for God to take away the shame that you have inside and ask him to fill you with his hope so that you may be rooted and established in his love. God, the great surgeon, loves you. Receive his love today. Amen. So a very powerful start. Um, now I'm going to invite Steve to come and join me. So Steve, I think you've possibly had the longest journey <laughs> to get here. You've come all the way from... From North Oldham, just about 10 miles north of Newcastle. It's so quite a long way today. Incredible, <laughs> incredible. Thank you so much for, well, to everybody for entering this competition, but also for, you know, making the journey today. So would you like to share with us a little bit about the context that you would preach this sermon? Um, well, I'm thinking in terms of the congregations that I would be preaching to in South East Northumberland, and that could range from anything from a small chapel with six <laughs> worshippers to a large church with a hundred members of the congregation, young, old, middle-aged. So hopefully there's a little bit of something for everyone in what I'm going to say this evening. Fantastic. Okay, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Good evening. In 1 Corinthians 13 and verses 4 to 7, we read the following words of Paul the Apostle on the power of love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. The story is told of two television aerials that met one day on a rooftop in London. <laughs> Gradually, they fell in love. And one of them proposed to the other. And they decided to get married. And they invited TV aerials from the whole of London to this wonderful ceremony. The wedding service wasn't that good, but the reception was fantastic. <laughs> yes, isn't love a marvellous thing? When you experience it, when you feel it, isn't love a wonderful thing? And that's the love that we read about in these words from Paul the Apostle. And using Paul's words tonight, I want to draw out, if I may, three aspects of the power of love. And these are the power of kindness, the power of forgiveness, and the power of perseverance. And so firstly, love and the power of kindness. Love is patient, love is kind, as Paul tells us. And our God is, of course, the God of love, and his son, Jesus Christ, was and is the true representation of love, both in terms of patience and kindness. During his ministry, Jesus dealt with so many different people, and he always had time for them. He always received them and helped them in their hour of need, whether they were depressed, whether they were lonely, whether they were ostracized, whether they were feeling down and out, whether they were ill, whatever the case, whatever their need, our Lord was always with them, with compassion and kindness. You remember the story of Jairus' daughter, where they came to Jesus and said, don't bother the master, it's too late, it's too late. I'm sure Jesus had had a hard day that day, and he probably felt like going and having a rest. 
taking some downtime. But no, Jesus, in his love and kindness and compassion, said, take me to her. And so they took him. And he went to Jairus' daughter and took her by the hand and brought her back to life and wholeness. His compassion and his kindness. Did you know that some years ago they did an international survey amongst high school students and they asked these students, can you please tell us what is the characteristic of an outstanding teacher? And so they did. And they wrote it down and they collated it. Numbers 1 to 10. Yeah, discipline was in there, but well down the list. The number one quality, according to the students, of an outstanding teacher was someone who is kind and cares for us. I've been working with young people for over 30 years. And I can tell you that they're no fools. They know instinctively when the person in front of them is kind and cares for them and wants to help them. <coughs> Kindness is an amazing thing that really does speak volumes of the love of God and the power of love. And it was kindness on the part of a Methodist minister that brought my wife, Alison, to profess faith in Jesus Christ. Tragically, Alison had lost her boyfriend who died from a brain tumour. And on one occasion, the minister of her parents' church came to the house on a pastoral visit. And they explained to the, uh, the minister what had happened to their daughter. And uh, he went away and a week afterwards, he came back again. Alison answered the door and he said, oh, um, mum and dad are not in at the moment. He said, oh no, no, no. I don't want your mum and dad. I was thinking about you. I just was passing and I, I wanted to know how you're getting on. The words of that minister had a dramatic effect on my wife. And as a result of that, she came to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Saviour. The power of kindness. And we too will seek to be kind and to show kindness and compassion to all those whom we meet. Love and the power of kindness. Secondly, love and the power of forgiveness. And Paul says, love does not keep a record of wrongs. <coughs> when I was a young lad growing up in Bradford in Yorkshire, I used to play a cricket game on the front garden. I used to have a ball and I'd throw it against the wall and dive and catch it. I'd pretend I was playing for Yorkshire County Cricket Club. And guess what? We won every match. <laughs> it was amazing. One day, I got hold of a proper cricket ball. And I was tempted to use it. Can I? Can't I? Oh, go on, it'll not do any harm. So I used it. And the ball went right through the window of my mum and dad's bedroom. <laughs> I was quite worried. <laughs> and then I went... And my mum said to me those dreaded words, wait until your dad gets home. <laughs> You'll be for it. And my dad did come home. And I heard him marching up the stairs as I hid under the duvet. <laughs> and he came into the room and we came face to face. And all I could think of saying was, dad, I'm really sorry. And my dad looked at me and he said to me, don't worry, lad, it's only a window. We can fix that. And Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, <coughs> where he died for our undoing and for our sins. And on that cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The power of love and forgiveness. <coughs> Even though God had every right to cast us away, he didn't. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus. The power of love and forgiveness. And finally, the power of perseverance. Love and the power of perseverance. 
And again, Paul says to us, love always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus suffered so much as he carried our sins on the way to Calvary. The anguish and torment and, and hurt must have been unbelievable. And I guess he probably did think, do I really need to go through with this? Can I really persevere? Can I do it? And he prayed that prayer in Gethsemane. Father, if possible, please take this cup from me. And then in sheer love, he said, but not my will be done, but yours. <coughs> and he went to the cross. And on the cross, he said those words. It is finished. Jesus completed the task that he'd been given to do. He completed his mission. He did not give up. Love persevered to the very end. After two miscarriages and a great deal of heartache and soul searching, my wife and myself, many years ago, took the decision to adopt a little girl. 20 years ago, to be exact, we adopted Molly. But Molly came with lots of baggage, and my, it was difficult. It was hard. It was a challenge. There were so many obstacles in those first months and first year. And many's the time that we said, we can't do this. We can't keep going. And someone said to me, to me just pray over her. And I prayed over her and said to her, Molly, remember one thing. Whatever you do, whatever the problems, whatever the obstacles, we will never, ever stop loving you. And you know, from that time, there was a kind of a turning point in our lives. Things got better. Things got easier. And fast forward 20 years, and Molly is a wonderful 24-year-old who's got a master's degree in food science and nutrition and lectures us frequently on what we should and shouldn't be eating. <laughs> oh, and by the way, we love her. We really love her. And we feel in our hearts that she loves us too. I thank God for the gift of love, a love which is strong, which never gives up, and perseveres to the end. And I wonder, what is it that you're going through? What is it that you're battling with today, tonight, at this time? What's the vision that you have from God? What has, vision, what has God put on your hearts that he wants you to do? Are you finding it easy, or are there obstacles? Remember this, that love never, ever, ever gives up and perseveres to the very end. As Mother Superior says in that great film, which I love dearly, The Sound of Music, <coughs> climb every mountain, ford every stream, follow every rainbow, until, not in case you might one day, but until you find your dream. <coughs> and then she goes on to sing, a dream that will need all the love you can give every day of your life for as long as you live. And that's the love that we contemplate and we celebrate today. Let me finish where I started with those two television aerials in London. TV aerials, what do they do? What is their raison d'etre? They receive and they transmit. They take in and they pass on. And that's what we're called to do as members of the body of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to do, to experience and to receive that love of God and to pass it on to those whom we meet. A love that shows kindness, a love that shows forgiveness, and a love that never, ever, ever gives up. The power of love. Amen.
and you might have seen me clutching this book. Part of the competition, for those of you that don't know, is that um, when we receive entries to the event, to the competition, um, they are sent off and they're adjudicated anonymously, so nobody has any idea about who's actually submitted. And um, we ask for a top ten, and they get published in this book. And of course, our four who are here are all in this book. And it's just part of our way of saying thank you for all this incredible work that you've done. And you can, if you want to, purchase the book, which is at the back of the room in, in the little break later on. But it's, it's good. So now we're going to um, hear from Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Hello. So where do you come from? Um, I come from Lancaster, so, <laughs> so you've it's like also... an hour north of Manchester. <laughs> so you've had a bit of a journey too. Yeah, but it's, it, yeah, it's fine. Well, thank you <laughs> so I got to go much. on the Virgin Pendolino Express. Oh, so it's very travel exciting. Don't start and I got a table. So, <laughs> so you're yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so do you want to share with us a little bit um, about context? Yes, yeah, so I am in a, a rural parish um, north of, uh, uh, well, Lancaster and uh, we have between 40 and 50 people, um, families and uh, people in their kind of 60s, 70s and beyond. Um, I've kind of a bit of a missing gap in the youth but uh, yeah, similar to tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just saying to Emma that I feel like a bit of a phone to get congratulated for all this hard work. Really, it's all God. So, <laughs> there are just three words I want to say to you today. Three words I want you to hear today. Love is everything. Love is everything. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul writes of the indispensability of love and of all its character. It is patient, kind, slow to anger not self-seeking, it rejoices with the truth. It protects, trusts, hopes and perseveres. It does not keep a record of wrong, nor does it shame others. It's not proud or boastful. It is everything. Often read at weddings, this passage has a lot to say about love, but why did Paul choose to teach the Corinthians about it? Why was it so essential for him to impress upon them the greatness of love? Well, at the time of writing, the church in Corinth were falling out over which spiritual gifts were the greatest. And they were experiencing uh, disunity and jealousy as a result. The context of this particular chapter is that it comes immediately after Paul tells them that no one amongst them is vital. Yes, there are those with prominent gifts, but the whole church, the body of Christ, is one body with many parts. Paul writes that all those parts suffer with one another and rejoice with one another. They are one body. And so Paul's focus on love in 1 Corinthians 13 makes sense as he seeks to help them live well and love well. You could be the greatest at prophesying, but without love, it's nothing. You could have a real gift for preaching, but done without love, it is nothing. You could have everything that is outwardly good and seen as special, but without love, it is nothing. Whilst all you're fighting about, says Paul, will cease to exist, love will always remain. In fact, we see in verse 10 that love is completeness. And Paul builds his argument that the greatest, the most excellent way is love. He says when we are complete, when we are fully grown, when we are whole, we won't, uh, love will be everything. We won't need to worry about who's <coughs> preaching or who's not because love will be enough. Love is everything. I wonder if you have seen the film The Greatest Showman. Um, it quickly became a box office success 
Uh, but on the face of it, it's, I'm sorry if you love this, but it's quite shallow. Um, <laughs> I love it, but it's quite shallow. And it's only very loosely based on the main character, P.T. Barnum's life. And yet the music explodes onto the screen and tells us of truths which lie within all of us. And I'm certain that it is uh, this stirring of emotions from within that's been the catalyst for the film's success. But what does all this have to do with love? What's this got to do with God's word, I hear you ask? Well, fear not. This is not the gospel according to Hugh Jackman just yet. <laughs> when I'm in the early stages of preparing to preach, I like to run. And I will mull over the passage that I've been um, wrestling with. And sometimes I'll mutter along to myself and phrase things, rephrase things. And sometimes I have moments of inspiration and they come from nowhere uh, like a sucker punch. They're usually at the point in the run when I'm struggling along physically and my thoughts are turning to survival. <laughs> it's almost as though when I'm physically empty, God comes alongside me and fills me spiritually. And it was at this point, at the end of February, when the song from the musical, um, Never Enough, came onto my shuffle playlist. It was at this point that I felt utterly winded and yet had total clarity. And it was at this point that I began to cry. You see, the words that are woven through this melody have a power. This wasn't the first time that this particular song had made me cry. When I watched the film the first time with my husband, and we both teared up, and he's kind of shaking his head, but he's tearing up. But at the time when I watched the film, the lyrics reminded me of how I feel God working in my life. This idea that nothing I could ever do in my life would be enough without him by my side. But nevertheless, here I was several months later, crying because God had revealed something different to me. The song says this, All the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky would never be enough, never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little, these hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough, never be enough for me. God does not need the shine of a thousand spotlights. He already holds the world in his hands. Indeed, he does not need to steal the stars from the night sky because they are his already. And yet he chose to say, it's never enough, I'm not done. He chose to send his most beloved son to live on earth, to be crucified and to rise again. Why? So we can encounter him. So creation can be restored. So we can take his hand and share in his story. And some stuff like it says, take my hand, will you share this with me? Because darling, without you, it will never be enough. This is the most extravagant and overwhelming display of love in all of history. And the song, according to its writers, is supposed to feel exactly like that. Overwhelming. Extravagant. They wanted to conjure up the image of somebody in their tower counting all their riches and it not adding up to be enough. And that was what came to mind when I was mulling over 1 Corinthians on a long six-mile run. God's love for us is so extravagant, so rich, so <coughs> complete, that he could not leave us and creation after the fall. All that we read about love in 1 Corinthians 13 is part of God's character because he is love. God is patient. <coughs> God is kind. He does not envy he does not boast. He is not proud. God does not dishonour others, nor is he self-seeking, nor easily angered. God does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. God always protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. God never fails. He is complete and whole. And yet he chose to say... 
it's not enough. His love is so complete, so whole, that despite our lack of completeness, he chose us. He chooses us. He chooses the impatient mother, the unkind classmate, the self-praising boss, the um, proud and boastful social media influences, the unkind classmate, the angry teenager. He chooses the uh, couple who bring up old grievances and new fights. He chooses the teacher who fails to protect, the colleague who uh, can't see the hope, the student dropout who can't persevere. We all know these people. We are these people. And God loves us anyway. It is written throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, and we, we know that verse in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Whosoever should believe in him would not perish, would not die, would have eternal life. So as we think about how God loves us that much, that he would rather send his Son to die on the cross than live for eternity without us, it may be that you recognise one of those character traits in your life. How does your record of wrongdoing affect your relationships? What does always being hopeful look like in your life? How is love hindered by your lack of generosity to those who wrong you? For me, I struggle with patience. I used to be a primary school teacher and then um, I thought I was quite patient. And then I had a child and I realised... I'm not patient. <laughs> so I have a three-year-old and um, it often feels like Groundhog Day as I spend another 90 minutes to two hours trying to get her to swallow her food. <laughs> How can it take so long to eat such a simple meal? And yet the impact that has on my relationship with her is negative. It creates tension rather than peace. Friction rather than joy. Sadness rather than happiness. It's something I'm working on at the moment, and it is hard work as I figure out endless new ways to stay calm as I shovel more yogurt in her mouth. <laughs> and yet, if God can look at my poor track record with him, I think it's poor, I'm sure it's poor for many of us, but... If you can look at my poor track record and my journey with him and show love in his patience with me, I can surely try to do the same with my toddler. So what is it in your life which is stopping you from showing love? God looks at us and he says it will never be enough. So why is it enough for us to say we love and yet to withhold it in myriad ways shown in 1 Corinthians 13. What would our relationships look like if we worked on ourselves in these, in these areas? How could our communities be transformed if our love looked like God's love? Love is everything. Let's do it right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now we're going to welcome Claire. Claire, you have to wait and hear all the other sermons, but we're really looking forward to hearing what you've got to say as well. So would you like to tell us a little bit about the context that you were preaching? Yes, I'm um, come up from Kent, um, go to a small village church, which is usually very full, um, ranging from lovely seniors in our community through down to lots of families. And if you were at my church, you would have just had the passage read from Luke 8, which in fact Steve referred to, of um, the story of Jairus' encounter with Jesus. If this was 
the television episode of Casualty, the scene would have opened with a 999 call handler. Nearest unit, divert to Church Lane. Pediatric emergency at the vicarage. 12-year-old girl, unconscious, breathing irregular. Hello, you're still there, Mr Jairus? Stay on the line, please. There's an ambulance on the way to your daughter. And we'd watch the anguished father waiting frantically at the end of his driveway, only to see the approaching blue lights being flagged down further back along the road at a bus stop by some pale, unkempt woman who often slept in the bus shelter. But it's not casualty. And there are no blue light ambulances in first century Palestine. Jairus is a leader at the synagogue in a small Galilean town. His only daughter, the apple of his eye, just 12 years old, is critically ill, her survival on a knife edge. As his precious girl deteriorates, Jairus blunders out of his house, gazes briefly at the synagogue next door, then hurries into town. He's looking for a maverick traveling preacher named Jesus, who seems to know God rather better than the religious elite do. It's not hard to find him, surrounded by the usual large entourage. Jairus takes one shuddering glance at the crowd, wishing this wasn't all so public, and then throws himself at Jesus' feet. Come, please, my daughter, I think she's dying. We need your help. Yes, of course, responds Jesus. Thank you, thank you. This way gabbles Jairus, hurrying Jesus along. In the heaving crowd, just a few pieces of humanity away from Jairus is a woman. According to Jewish law, her ailment makes her tainted, an outcast. Any wealth she once possessed has long since been paid to unsuccessful gynaecologists. That's a little detail in Mark's gospel, which is omitted by Dr. Luke. <laughs> She's impoverished, excluded from the community, excluded from synagogue worship. For 12 years, she's lived on the unwanted edges of society, physically, relationally, and spiritually diminished. Have you ever been in a hall of mirrors or a lift with mirrored walls where you can see a reflection of your reflection in the mirror behind? And a reflection of the reflection of that reflection and so on, with more and more reflections peeling away into infinity. Like reflections in mirrors, these two stories entwined in Luke 8 reflect each other. They are stories of love in action, and we glimpse the far-reaching implications of the power of God's love to heal, restore, and transform. The woman is lonely, weak, and anemic, but in faith has set her hope on a man who's reached out in love to transform other outcasts. Lepers, a paralyzed man, even a chained madman. She dare not approach Jesus directly because she shouldn't be mixing with the crowd in the first place. Hiding her face under her shawl, she creeps through the throng, gradually tiptoeing closer until, hope surging, she reaches out. She only manages to touch the edge of Jesus' cloak, but instantly knows she's healed. Then swiftly she retreats back into anonymity. It's a spine-tingling moment, all the more fascinating, because it actually reads as if it's an unintentional healing which catches Jesus by surprise. I'll spare you the physics lesson, but it's as though Jesus is supercharged with static electricity. And with just the slightest touch, his power ignites, pulsing into the woman like a lightning bolt. Jesus is just a Jewish man with splinter-toughened carpenter's hands. Yet mysteriously, within his human frame is packed all the power of the creator of the cosmos. Paul's beautiful passage in Philippians 2 reminds us that 
Jesus made himself nothing, became like a servant, made in human likeness, yet he was in very nature God. These same hands that had chiselled wood could unfurl a banquet for thousands from a small picnic parcel or sweep away the scars of dreaded skin diseases. The gentlest touch of his fingertips could fire up blind retinas. With one nod of his head and gesture to draw from a giant water jar, he could supply Chateau Tainer's special reserve. <laughs> the soles of his feet could stun the water molecules of Lake Galilee into totally un-Newtonian behaviour. And one word of rebuke from his lips could silence a catastrophic weather system or quell the madness of a disturbed spirit. And today, just a hopeful fingertip touch on the edge of his cloak has healed a hidden but debilitating disease. Jesus isn't going to let this woman settle for secret physical healing. This desolate woman is as much a beloved daughter of God as the precious child languishing in Jairus' house. Jesus stops, and at the insistence of his voice, the retreating woman has to turn back and falls trembling at his feet. Jairus is tugging on the edge of Jesus' cloak too, urging him onwards, but Jesus won't budge. Jairus glances down at the figure crouched at Jesus' feet, just as he, Jairus, had been minutes earlier, pleading for his daughter. The slight hunch of the woman's shoulders tells him she too is flinching under the scrutiny of the many surrounding eyes. That's my spot, thinks Jairus, shaking with desperation. That little patch of ground at Jesus' feet. My last thread of hope taken by someone else. But time has stopped. Jesus is in no hurry. There in the presence of the very crowd who'd excluded her for 12 years, Jesus gives the woman a platform to speak her story. He gives her the affirmation of being called daughter with the declaration of complete restoration. Your faith has healed you. Shalom, go in peace. Healed physically, relationally and spiritually. No longer unclean. She's now pure, fully part of society, able to worship in community once again made whole by the power of God's love. And then, messengers arrive from Jairus' home and the situation turns deadly serious. It's too late, say they're sadly shaking heads. Jesus, looking at Jairus with a love that transcends time, says, don't be afraid, just believe, and she will be healed. In this moment of crisis, the synagogue ruler is gently being prompted by Jesus to follow the example of a woman who Jairus has been excluding from his synagogue for the entire length of his daughter's life. You knelt at my feet, she knelt at my feet. Your daughter is loved. This woman, God's precious daughter, is loved. My power has restored this woman. My power can restore your daughter too. Don't be afraid, just believe. Will Jairus turn Jesus away and stumble home into crushing grief, forever resentful of the wretched woman who stole his place in the queue? No, Jairus chooses to believe and presses onwards with Jesus. 
When they arrive, Jesus sweeps through the vanguard of wailing mourners into Jairus' home. It's a day for vaulting over all kinds of boundaries. Contact with an unclean woman was just the start. Now Jesus breaks another Jewish taboo by reaching out and deliberately touching a corpse. My child, get up, he says simply. And to the astonishment of her parents, she breathes again and climbs to her feet. New life, like being born again. I expect she's hungry, smiles Jesus. Like the mirrors mentioned earlier, these intertwined stories reflect the power of God's love, shining into far-reaching places. It starts with something familiar to many, parental love for a child. In the highly patriarchal society of that time, it's particularly moving to read how this father cherishes his only daughter. In crisis, when he feels powerless, love for his daughter propels Jairus out of the constraints of his religious cultural framework, risking the severe disapproval of his religious colleagues, and makes him seek Jesus. And if we grasp nothing else from this passage, then this is an example to emulate. Let our love and concern for others galvanize us to seek Jesus and bring him into whatever we're dealing with. But the story of the woman enlarges this principle. God's love is not just for those we regard as the in people, the ones we love and cherish, those who are personally important to us. The power of God's love is emphatically intended for the outsider, the lost, unlovely, misunderstood, excluded, those on the edge. The reality is that this side of heaven will never be perfectly whole and healed. We'll still face all kinds of difficulties and heartbreak. But there's no area of any life that is too lost or too dark or too painful for God. He longs to mend and restore everything we bring to him. Because the ultimate expression of the power of love was demonstrated in desolate weakness on the cross, where Jesus completed the transaction which paid for our deepest healing. These stories beckon us onwards towards a glimpse of the future kingdom, the hope of creation renewed in perfect wholeness. Meanwhile, let's reach out in faith to the God who loves us and reach out to those on the edge who need to know the power of that restoring love for themselves too. Amen. Amen. It's been really challenging. We've been asked to name a winner and a runner-up, and in many ways I find that very difficult because I want to celebrate what each of you has done, and that's been very much where the conversation has been long. But we have now named our runner-up and our winner, and so the runner-up for the sermon of the year 2019 is Olivia. sense that there's a real potential for you as a preacher and we would really encourage you to keep going with it, to keep growing, to discover your voice and your confidence with the text because we're excited about what's ahead of you. So well done. And the winner of the Sermon of the Year is Claire. We really 
enjoyed how you took us into the text and how you brought us to encounter with Jesus. Thank you so much for what you did tonight. Thank you. We do have some runners-up gifts as well for, for Steve. Do you, oh, Louisa, do you want some help? <laughs> do some help, both of you. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. I think it's been, I've just heard some amazing things this evening. I'm really, really grateful to you all for coming and sharing in this with us. Um, I'm sure you share with me in thanking the team who have put so much effort into making this event happen, um, the LWPT team, the LST team, and to our fabulous panel. Thank you so much. Your feedback is just inspirational, and I'm sure that you will feel and agree with me, it's so helpful to have the feedback that we've had. So I'm just going to ask um, Louisa, who is the editor of Preach, to come and close this evening with prayer. Mm -hmm.